I wanted to talk a little bit about transitions and maybe even talk a little bit um, in an unexpected way as we think about the adults that are making the transition. So I'll start with just a quick backstory on why other than the time of year. Um, so just a quick thing about the backstory about why transitions other than it's August and for many of us in the United States, that means shifting gears from a summertime routine to um, a school time routine. So um, we knew that, you know, like even from my work um, in Iowa when I was there working with my teams that were transitioning from early intervention uh, to preschool, um, we learned that transitions aren't just about the handoff. It's not just the first day of school. So it's lovely that everybody takes these pictures of their kids, but what did it take to prepare for that day to get that picture of their first day? And or what does the adjustment look like once they actually make it from the house or the apartment to the school building or wherever they might be going um, to receive um, uh, educational learning experiences. And so what we know is that transitions take preparation, there's the handoff, and there's this adjustment period. Not just are we making the transition from summer back to school, but from a half day to a full day. And so there's all these things and to shift what they're thinking about is a transition. And then thinking about kids to share and exchange objects is a transition. So then I got all big in terms of like their little quote unquote transitions, asking somebody to share, asking somebody to have a different thought, which are really big ideas. And then there are these big, huge shifts from, you know, early access or early intervention to preschool. There's a big, big divide from preschool to big, bad, scary school district in terms of kindergarten. And then there's all these initiatives that were trying to be P3. And so I thought, okay, let's break it down. And let's think about how can we find more common ground? How can we make these transitions more um, graceful and less dramatic? So I thought, okay, how do we make this big, huge um, bridge, if you will, between uh, P3, how do we do it from early intervention to preschool? And then how do we think about transitions even just in a day-to-day -day shifting gear, shifting minds, shifting what kids are thinking about having to share and exchange objects? So we started talking about learning centers. And so as I was preparing to talk to hundreds, I don't know, felt like there were hundreds of amazing kindergarten teachers, um, everything I was reading to prepare really agitated me. So all of the solutions for how we prepare kids for kindergarten or how we make this divide between um, preschool and kindergarten smaller or shorter is, well, we do two things. We either flippantly say, well, kindergarten has to be ready for children. Like, okay, yeah, sure, but what do you want me to do about that? We can get on our high horse and say, well, I'm sorry, kindergarten just isn't developmentally appropriate. And all that focus on rigor isn't helping anyone. Well, that doesn't help anyone either. Or maybe worse, we say, oh, you know what, little three-year-old? Someday you're going to have to go to kindergarten. So you might as well start practicing that hashtag developmentally inappropriate crap now because we're going to expect you to do it in three years from now. So like neither of those solutions was helpful. Everything I read was like just complaining to kindergarten that they needed to be less rigorous and more developmentally appropriate when A, developmentally appropriate and rigor are synonyms. And then B, the other solution was, okay, buck up preschooler. You're going to have to go to kindergarten someday. So let's get practicing these things you will have to do then. Now, didn't like it. So I said, okay, where can we find common ground? And where can that common ground be something other than here, just do what I do longer or here, do what I do earlier right? You see the problem. So I started to think about learning centers, which even then it's like, well, in preschool, we kind of call them center time. In kindergarten, if you're lucky enough to have centers, they're still learning centers. And unfortunately, the playtime is like on the peripheral. After we've done the work, you can go play sort of mentality. We didn't like that either. So how do we really bridge this transition from what we think about as really good developmentally appropriate practice as well as really good rigor that will help children learn, develop, grow, and thrive. So I picked learning centers and I said, okay, what can preschool push up? 
What can preschool be in the little seeds that we are? And maybe even this could start earlier, right? With our early access friends there in Iowa. How can we um, take this foundation and push it up into kindergarten, dare I say, first, second, and third grade? as well as what can I pull down? So I was thinking like maybe as a preschool person, I can think of um, kindergarten as like my big wise sister, like my older wise sister who has lots of stuff to teach me if I would just listen to her for half a minute, right? So my older sister Janet would be like, yes, of course, it's taken you 50 years to know I had so much wisdom, right? So what can I pull down if I'm a preschool person? What can I pull down? And again, this is not about pushing up and just saying, do preschool longer, though I'm not really opposed to that. And it's also not saying, what can I pull down and start doing earlier? It's really, what can I learn from each of those environments about developmentally appropriate practice and rigor? So when we think about this idea of um, see, I had to get my notes. When we think about what can we learn from each other, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas of we'll start with pushing up. How's that? So we'll start with what can preschool share with kindergarten, first, second, third grade that might have relevance in those settings and really help kids transition not only from preschool to school, but even from summer to school or from one activity to the next. And so, A, kindergarten people, you got to have more choice in the day. I know, you're like, I would like to have more choice. This might be a district-wide conversation that we have to think about where is their choice or choice within a choice. So we've got to give kids a chance to choose and not choose between three really dull, boring activities. Like you can have this worksheet or this worksheet. No, this is child choice. You know, we all talk in preschool about being child directed and I know everybody's eyes roll in kindergarten, but really when neurons fire together, they wire together, right? So why not give people a choice of what they want? And oh yeah, we could do it in, pre in professional development too, but that's a whole other broadcast. Second, try not to think about traditional centers. So I know many of you have tried to move um, back to centers being in kindergarten. Maybe they got thrown out and now they're back. Maybe they're trying to make their way back. If you're making your way back, try not to think of just like literacy, math science, right? Try to think more whole child. Try to think about how can I let kids, oh, take the blocks out of the block area into the literacy area. Like, A, that's choice and non-traditional centers all at once. So it's a sort of idea that these traditional centers um, that we might have done in early elementary could learn a little bit from preschool and be much more about deconstruction, much more about joy and playing, much more about dramatic and sociodramatic interactions. So think about that and definitely don't think about play as one center and math as a different center. Why can't math be playful? And how do we have kids move in and out of those centers based upon choice? And then the third thing is just try to get rid of all that seat work. Sorry, kindergarten folks, but really, the worksheets are so over them, right? I'm not saying that there can't be boundaries. I'm not saying that kids can't sit and do independent work, but it still has to make your neurons fire. It can't just be all of this sort of um, flat kind of mm, stuff, right? So... We don't want to have so much seat work and we want to at the same time have more teacher movement. So many of you know this strategy. I want you to take all of your instruction and I want you to put it in your fanny pack. So instead of making all the instruction at your station or your center, you being the teacher, at your horseshoe table where the center is you, I want you to put all that great instruction, literacy, math, science, STEAM, STEM, whatever you want to call it, in your fanny pack. And I want you to get up and I want you to go out to all those different amazing centers. I want you to sprinkle the instruction. We call it embedded learning opportunities. But I want you to distribute all of that goodness. It gets you moving. It gets you out to where kids have made choices. That way you don't have to worry. What if they don't ever come to math? Bring the math to them. So if they are just loving the dramatic play area or the deconstruction center or a water table or the garden or whatever it is, take your instruction to kids. So I want more child choice. I want to see um, less sort of 
traditional organization, if you will. I want to see more movement. I want to see activities in those centers, kindergartners, that aren't so flat or aren't seat work. And then lastly, while you're out there, you great, amazing, amazing teachers, I want you to do less directing, less correcting, and more play. So I want you to join, sit beside, get to know your kids, see what they're interested in. Like sit beside them and watch, play alongside them, have fun, right? So that's what kindergarten, for second, third, can learn from preschool, what you can allow us to push up and continue for that P3 divide to not be so, you know, big of a division. So now, preschoolers, it's your turn. What can we learn from our wise sister or brother that's in kindergarten? What can we pull down and start earlier that isn't just practicing skills you need later earlier? Because I don't like that at all, right? So what can we pull down by way of wisdom? So I have four things for you all. So you preschool people, there are four things that you can pull down from kindergarten and start embedding right now with three, fours, and fives that will help them transition to kindergarten first and so forth. So number one, our learning centers, our center times can have a little bit more structure. Now, don't get me wrong. I did not say discrete trials. I did not say direct instruction. I did not say take the joy out of them. Instead of just allowing children to move in and out freely, which is still what I'm saying, there's a little bit of closure before they move to the next center or before they move on to the next play thing. So they're actually learning to complete a task. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. They're going to need lots of practice. They're going to need lots of support and modeling. But sometimes when children get older into kindergarten and first grade, there's an expectation that they'll work on something, complete it, and then do something. So that practicing earlier, that kind of circle or closing the loop is positive. We don't expect mastery, but we invite children to think about what could I finish building? What could I finish um, in terms of even a game. So if I'm playing a game, take my last turn before I walk off and see something like the shiny squirrel. And so we're just talking about closing the loop. Just put the marker lid on and close. So you're just completing things by building, constructing, finishing the game, finishing your turn, making that a little bit more intentional so that children start to see there's a beginning, a middle, and an end versus just this fluidity um, that can occur in a lot of preschool environments. Okay, number two. Lots more peer-to-peer. -peer. And this is more than just needing the transition. We know that there are some powerful, powerful research on friendships and peer-mediated interventions. So having peers interaction, again, get rid of the horseshoe table or the kidney room, or the kidney size table, right? Because that makes you the triangle. Child, child, me. The child has to talk to me, back to the child, back to me, back to this child. There's rarely, it's hard to talk to the person who's like mm, right here. It's easy to talk to the person who's across from me. So we really want to promote more peer mediated, more friendships, more peer interactions, just more interactions with peers side by side, face to face than me involved in that trifecta. But in, pre, in kindergarten, there's much more about buddy up with a pair, pair and share, work in a small group without an adult present. So the more we can foster peer-to-peer -peer social interactions in preschool, which is completely developmentally appropriate, the more they'll be ready for those kind of activities in kindergarten. Okay, number three. Ah, my favorite. This is channeling Maria Montessori, which you know I love a good Maria Montessori tip. So Maria Montessori, we want to have more self-correcting materials. Uh, usually I say something like um, the game operation, but think of a puzzle. Puzzles are self-correcting. Have you ever opened a puzzle that needed directions? Even if it's a thousand or a quadrillion uh, piece puzzle, it does not come with directions because we all know you can start anywhere, stop anywhere, but in the end, the puzzle has to be every piece in its place. So it's self-correcting. But if you can embed, right, sprinkle more self-correcting materials, it means that the kids will need you less often. Maria Montessori is 
fabulous at this. So if you know any directresses or people that are working in a uh, Montessori program, so think about tapping those, you know, fabulous members of the revolution and say, what are the self-correcting materials you use in Montessori? And then can you extrapolate those and use those in your pre-K classroom? That will help kids gain independence because again, when they go to kindergarten, they're going to be expected to play with others, right? Interact, complete a task, and do so more independently, meaning without you as an adult. So that's number three is increase independence, not by kicking them to the curb, not by saying buck up cupcake, but actually embedding more self-correcting materials. And then number four, because oftentimes when you interact with other people or you don't have an adult nearby, you actually have to solve your own problems. There's not a preschool teacher that's going to be there anticipating your every Every need and putting out the fires as they go, you're going to have to figure it out and you have to negotiate that. So the earlier we can start helping children learn, A, there is a problem, and then B, what are possible solutions, and then C, how can I begin to solve that problem? And the kicker is that children learn problem solving and perspective taking by doing pretend play. And pretend play is a huge center time activity. See, it all comes full circle. So the four things that preschool can learn from kindergarten and start now that's completely developmentally appropriate, can't even say it, totally developmentally appropriate, is that A, you can help children learn that activities, events, interactions even, have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Help them complete what they started. It doesn't mean that it has to be long. It doesn't mean you have to do every part of it, but get some closure to the interaction. Get some closure to the activity, which will help children in the future learn how to complete a task and before they move forward. Number two, more peers. Peer friendships, peer mediated intervention, just plain old peer interactions so that they're comfortable with how to play and interact with their peers. Number three, gain independence. My scaffolding or my uh, channeling of Maria Montessori for that one is use self-correcting materials. And then lastly, try to focus on problem solving skills. Try not to anticipate or solve all the problems for children. Let them get a little bit messy. Let them figure out what's working, what's not working, um, and help them learn what's the problem what are possible solutions and how can I do that by taking the perspective of others? There's a whole developmental continuum there. So we have to start early with the developmentally appropriate versions of problem solving, which means they can come to you and say they have a problem. It's just that self-awareness, right? That there is a problem in the first place. So those are a few things that will help bridge the P3 gap. They'll help us, you know, push up from preschool and pull down from kindergarten that doesn't require us doing things that are snarky, like, hey, just be developmentally appropriate in kindergarten. I know it's a problem with you. And it doesn't mean that we start making kids try to do things that they'll need later far too early because we know there's no reason nor any benefit to rushing development. Okay. I've kept you a long time, but I promised you a bonus. So there's this whole thing about a parallel track between children and adults, meaning that just about anything that's good for the goose is good for the gander. So what we know to be about challenges and struggles for transitions for children actually have a parallel that is a difficulty or challenge for adults. Because uh, I know uh, as adults, we have far more patience for young children um, than we do for our adult colleagues who may struggle with a transition. So my tip for you, the bonus tip for helping adults is practice, practice, practice. See, already you know this is the same thing for kids. If we want kids to do things better, they have to practice it, right? So same thing with adults. So I'm going to give you three things you can, um, three skills, three mindsets, I'm not sure quite what they are, that you're going to help staff to practice. So the first thing is practice the big thing in smaller ways. So, so they're going full on, full day preschool, I mean kindergarten, right? So it's not like we're going to ease into this. It's like Monday, let's go. All right. So how do I, as a kindergarten teacher, not get overwhelmed? How do I keep this sort of, oh, I'm happy to be here look, right? So practice allowing 
and inviting those kindergarten teachers to not be trying to be a perfectionist from eight o'clock to three o'clock. Like allow them to decide which part of whole day kindergarten do I really want to master first? I'm gonna still do full day kindergarten, but I'm gonna be really honing my craft in a part. So you're gonna practice parts of the whole before you're expected to do the whole perfectly. So we really want people to practice these skills that they don't yet have by breaking them into parts. That's one thing that your staff are going to need your time and your patience and your guidance to help them practice. Number two, repetition is key, right? I said practice, practice, practice. So we need to, before we get all shiny squirrel, this is exciting, this is the newest thing, oh, I'm ready to, make sure you're on autopilot with the first thing that you started. Make sure you have confidence and competence in that one thing and it's pretty much autopilot before you need to go adding on and doing things. So that repetition is key. It doesn't mean that we're not growing and learning and changing, and I know you want fidelity tomorrow, but I have to start small, I have to do it repeatedly, and then number three, I want you to help people celebrate, maybe even notice and then celebrate. So we have this negative track that plays in our head all too often that, um, you know, all the other kindergarten teachers have it figured out. Everybody else is doing it, you know, and I'm the only one that's not. I really want you to help your staff notice and celebrate every small little success, every small effort, any time that they came to the table with curiosity and not resistance, let's celebrate that, right? Let's help them create this track that says, I am enough. I am making a difference. I am doing work that matters. And so if we keep focusing on, well, you did eight out of the 10 things with Fidelity, but you got two more to go. Hmm. That tells me I'm not enough. So as their coach, as their champion, as their cheerleader, can you help them see, notice, celebrate even small successes? And when they struggle, maybe even when they fail, how can you help them get back up? That up until now tells me that there's room for growth and change and I'm going to knock it out of the park tomorrow. So those are, that's one tip, kind of three embedded in it, but your tip for helping adults transition is to let them practice, 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 and in particular, practice smaller pieces before the whole, give them lots of repetition until it becomes automatic, and then help them notice and celebrate even small successes. All right, thanks everybody.